University. Today, Professor Wayne Norman takes your questions about ethics when dealing with adversaries. Norman is the Mike and Ruth Mikowski Professor of Ethics in the Keenan Institute for Ethics and the Department of Philosophy. He writes two blogs, This Sporting Life, on his casual observations about the culture of athletics, and Ethics for Adversaries, on, he says, how to play fair when you're playing to win. To ask Norman a question, send an email to live at duke.edu. Tweet with the tag Duke Live or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm David Jarmel, the head of Duke's Office of News and Communications. Wayne Norman, welcome to Office Hours. Glad to be here. You are a political political philosopher who's written a lot about issues such as nationalism, citizenship, multiculturalism. In recent years, though, you've turned your attention quite a bit towards ethics in the business community. What does a perspective like yours bring to the conversation about the kinds of stories we see in our daily newspapers, such as one this week about some corporations paying little or no taxes? Um, wow, that's a big question. So, so one, when, I, uh, when I kind of entered into the the discussion of the business ethics scholarly community when I started teaching it uh, a little more than 10 years ago. Um, I, I found that as a political philosopher coming in, I was, I was interested largely in, in, the, in the way uh, our expectations of business people or of businesses um, depend a lot on, on how we set up markets they depend on, and what we expect markets to do in our society. And so, so I sort of had a, I sort of thought about sort of democracy, justice, markets, firms, and then what people do within those firms where the rules that they get are, in some, are coming to some extent from the system. Now, I think a lot, of, a lot of people that were in the field and that do work in business ethics and that are kind of attracted to issues in business ethics often come the other direction. They think about what it is to be a good moral person, what it is to be an ethical person, um, what it is to be a nice person, and then how that translates when you're all of a sudden finding yourself in a situation where you're at work and where you're making right. decisions for firms. So uh, we end up talking to each other and, and saying many of the same things, but I do look at it from, a, from, the, from the point of view of what we're expecting of the business system in a way. Um, you've written that the business community uses a lot of phrases about the, the, bottom, the triple bottom line or um, sustainability, corporate responsibility. Um, so those must come up a lot in your classes and discussions. Are those just words, or do they actually inform the kinds of conversations that you see unfolding in the business world? Yeah, that's um, that's a really good question. So what we're really trying to get at, all of these words, all of the ones you just mentioned, and uh, you know, I guess we could rattle off a few more. Did you say corporate citizenship? Okay. Um, and, we, and we keep coming, corporate social responsiveness. I mean, we keep sort of coming up with new ones. And they're all really trying to get at a, at a similar idea, which is, uh, what we expect businesses and business people to do, but I think in particular sort of businesses in their main policies, what we expect them to do over and above what's required by the law. So we sort of recognize, yes, we want you all to comply with the law, but that's, that's not really quite enough to be an ethical business, a responsible business. So these are, these are different frameworks that people are trying to use to, you know, to sort of articulate what those obligations but are. But if I see a CEO on television talking about corporate responsibility, I mean, you're, that's a, that is genuine, but at some level. I, or, or maybe I'll rephrase that. Mm. I, I, an underlying idea that I know that you've wrestled with is how do we as human beings who find ourselves in a corporation or in some other setting balance what we learned as kids about being good people with the norms that we may find within that world? And, 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 and you're trying to help us think through how we do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to shoulder all the responsibility, but yes, that's, it's a very complicated conversation, I think in part because, um, I mean, it, it, I think everybody, I, I used to teach in an MBA program for yeah. a while, and, and there's a, a, a real sense that MBA students have because they've generally worked for a few years, they're going back to study, they sort of know where they're going back into. And there's a real sort of conflict between ideals and the real world. Um, and I think that comes up in part with those, the different ways that we see our ethical obligations and duties. So 
we learn when we're when we're young, we learn, and and even just sort of ethics in our everyday life has an awful lot to do with sort of cooperating, with helping people, with with not just pursuing your own interests, but with recognizing that you know lots of people want to pursue their interests, and so how do we cooperate in ways mm -hmm. that that make this um, possible? And in business, what we've done in the business world, but also in in the political world, in international relations, in sports is we, we've actually set up, a, a, an in, set up institutions where we actually don't want people to cooperate. We want them to compete. And we, we do that on purpose because we think that competition will you know, provide certain kinds of incentives or will provide, you know, will, will, well, will en end up producing results that are better than if people just tried we to- We believe in competition yeah. in this country. Yeah. So are you saying competition brings out the worst in us from an ethical standpoint or? So, it, you know, it certainly can, but, uh, but in fact, we, we, don't have to be, we don't have to have competitive institutions in many of these realms where we have them. So we, uh, you know, we've seen other examples in history where people don't have comp competitive markets. They just have, you know, a bureaucracy that sort of decides and sets up factories and produces stuff. And we've right. seen what's, what, how that, how not, that doesn't uh, not always work out as planned. Yeah. We've seen lots of political systems that don't have competitive elections where they just try to find a benevolent dictator. Um, and we've seen, uh, we, there are other f kind of physical athletic like um, uh, forms of performance that don't involve competition. But we've, but we've chosen in many cases, we know we've chosen, we're gonna have competitive markets, we're gonna have competitive elections, we're gonna have competitive sports because these do give us benefits, even if they can bring out the worst in people sometimes, they also bring out the best in people sometimes. But right. all of this is kind of, is a little bit different from what we learned about ethics and morality sometimes, um, you know, when we were kids or in Sunday school or in primary school or... Or even in more traditional yeah. philosophy yeah. kinds of courses, and maybe we'll, we'll come back yeah. to that in a second. But what I find so interesting is that you're, you, you have really latched on to this common tension, as you said, mm -hmm. whether it's in business or in politics uh, or with our kids' baseball team, that we have competition, which is good in many mm -hmm. ways. Um, we have our ethical behavior, the way we like to see ourselves in the mirror, but there in the real world, you come to the question of, well, should we pay these more taxes or whatever yeah. the issue is? So how do you encourage students and others to, to think their way through that? Well, so that's... Um Gosh, I wish I had a, if I had a concise answer to that, it might make my job a lot easier. Um, well, that's, so, that's the whole, so, why it's so interesting. So it's, one of the things, you mentioned students. So I, I, I'm trying an experimental stu course this, uh, this term with, a, with some students who are up for it, um, uh, a sort of keen, keen bunch of students, and we're working through something together, which is really that problem of how do we think about, is, is there some way of looking at all of these, what I've been calling deliberately adversarial institutions that I just mentioned, things like sports and, and business and politics. Uh, is there a way of looking at, and, and another one, for example, is criminal law, where, again, we don't have to do it in an adversarial way, but we, we sort of believe that, you know, ha prosecution and defense having their own attorneys who are fighting to win. And that justice, justice will emerge yeah. from this process. And the justice will emerge, you know, more often from that process than if you just had a uh, a kind of inquisitor who listened to the listened to the evidence and made a right. decision. So, so we're looking at all of all of these institutions and trying to find out whether there is actually whether there are very common kinds of of norms and principles that we expect of the players. So, just to give an example, um, I think in, in many ways the easiest example is sports, where um, and the, and the concept that we use, which is the analogous to those ones you mentioned about corporate social responsibility or, or corporates good, being a cor good corporate citizen is the concept of sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. So we expect a person to be, we expect athletic competitors to be good sportsmen or good sports. Uh, so we expect them to follow the rules, but even to follow the rules when they could get away with it. Or even, you know, not to break a rule when the referee isn't looking. Or even in many cases to sort of follow the spirit of the rules even when Right. You know, Most notably, a golfer is supposed to report himself yeah. if he if he did something, even if nobody saw it. Yeah. And you shouldn't sort of flagrantly foul someone for no reason in a basketball. Yeah, and there game. may be some, there may be a case where you could do a deliberate kind of check or tackle of somebody in a particular sport where uh, you wouldn't get penalized for it, but you knew that if you did it in a particular way because of the position the person was in, you would injure that person, and so you kind of back off. Right. Um, even if that person is a star on the other team that would you know where it might actually help you to win. So, so sportsmanship is, is the way we talk about that in the realm of sports. And, 
you know, business ethics is the way we talk about it in the realm of ethics. But the and, broad concept here is ethics for adversaries, which yeah. in fact is the name yeah. of, of one of your two wonderful blogs. And and it's this guiding idea of if of how how do you simultaneously have an adversarial yeah. relationship but an ethical relationship. Um, uh, first, want to remind our people watching the show that we invite your questions for Professor Norman and you can send them in. You'll see on your screen a variety of ways and we'd be happy to share them with Professor Norman. Um, I want to go back to something you said just a moment mm -hmm. ago um, about uh, about being an ethicist and um, being in a, in a business environment and how that's, you, you tell an interesting story about when you first went to the business school that the kinds of questions people were asking you were, were different from what you would experience previously when you were in a more conventional philosophy department mm -hmm. or, or dealing um, with political or more traditional kinds of, anyway, non-business philosophy. Maybe you could talk about that, of, of how people sort of approached your role and asked different kinds of questions. I thought it was fascinating. Well, so um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. So one of the, one of the <laughs> One of the um, one of the first experiences I had was I had studied ethics as a student as a graduate student for many years and I taught it for for several years before in a philosophy department before I went to a, a business school and the and, and, and in a philosophy department really what you're inter what you're interested in is is trying to to just to develop and justify principles and theories perhaps theories that that somebody could use in order to kind of think their way through a decision-making process when they have an ethical problem. So do we use something like utilitarianism, which tells us um, what you should do is you should figure out all of the possible effects of your different uh, decisions and, and, and dis different courses of action and take the course of action that would have the best possible results. Or say the golden rule is another decision-making process that says, well, think about the actions you want to do and think about the one that you would want somebody to do to you or wouldn't want somebody to do to you. Right. So those are two you know, different ways that we can think through it. Um, and so philosophers just sort of spend a lot of time thinking about how we would justify those theories. What's the status of those theories? Do those, do those principles really exist or have we just made them up? Right. Are there values in the universe or are these just things that we invent? And in a business setting? And, it, and so what I found that, um, and so, but the one thing that, that in general philosophy departments you know, at least in, in, in particularly, I think maybe in the era when I was studying, don't do is that they don't conceive of their job in an ethics class of trying to make the students more ethical. In other words, they're not, in a sense, trying to, they're not uh, mostly trying to motivate people to be more ethical. That's, mm -hmm. It's not the purpose of the ethics class in a way. It's as if you assume, let's assume people want to be ethical, but they don't know what the right decision right. procedure is. And you're is. providing a framework to think about yeah. it. And then in, and the in a business, and, and so just to come back to your question, so in a business school, when they hire somebody to teach business ethics, yeah. a lot of what they're concerned about and a lot of what, what their donors and constituents are concerned about is producing graduates who will be more ethical business people. Um, so in a way they want much more, they're looking for much more sort of practical advice about how you, would, how you would be an ethical business manager. And that actually ends up requiring, I think, almost a completely different syllabus than what you would use to teach a similar course hmm. in a philosophy department. So uh, an example we're seeing in the news the last few days, and we'll be seeing over the next several months, more than a year, on this theme of ethics for adversaries is in the political arena, mm -hmm. which you referred to before. The Republican presidential campaign is just beginning to crank mm -hmm. up with mm -hmm. uh, Newt Gingrich and Tim Pawlenty and others beginning to show signs that they're going to run and that that list is likely to be, become a lot larger. Um, you had something on your blog, maybe we could put it up on the screen, noting how political parties are need to compete heavily and often ruthlessly, but then they're expected after that process to come unite together, which seems to exemplify this theme about being adversaries but coming together. Yes. Maybe you could talk about that. Well, the, the first thing I'd like to say is that this, this uh, just a, a bit of background on this blog, this is the blog that for at least uh, for the current semester, I'm sharing with the students in this class that I mentioned before. Um, and that particular post was actually from one of my one of my students, which um, is great. And so what we're uh, so the one thing that we're doing in the class at this stage in the class is that they've they've they're each doing individual projects where they're focusing on some different adversarial institution. Um, so one of them one of them is doing uh, ethics for lawyers and how how you how you sort of play to win for your for your for your client, but also sort of observe certain rules. So this one is on is on. Uh, um, is on uh, on adversarial politics. The, the, 
the idea is interesting for a number of reasons. One is that for for probably 20 years, political philosophers have talked a lot about democracy. They always they always do. And the buzzword has been deliberative democracy. And almost all of the reflection by, by, by political philosophers on democracy has been about how we can sort of deliberate better, compromise, listen better, give everybody their voice. All of these things are extremely important, how we can, how we can respect political equality um, of all citizens um, and have it reflected in our decision-making process. Very important stuff. Uh, but it turns out that we actually have a system that's competitive, not cooperative in that way. So and it, that is what and, it is, and we do, and that is what it is. So we do, and 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 I think that this is reflected in, if you will, a kind of schizophrenic discourse that we have every single day, uh, in politics, where uh, on the one hand, everybody expects that the the elected officials are supposed to be doing the people's business. Yeah. So that yes, there's a contest, but there's a sense in which we want that. You know, once that contest is decided, we want them to be sort of more like public servants. Right. That their that their job at that point is to sort of do the best for society. On the other hand, you know, we ha we have decided that uh, we're going to put them in this hyper competitive situation. I mean, it's the U.S. is actually very rare in having elections every two years for some of its elected officials. It's very hard not to expect people to be on a permanent in permanent campaign mode when you're running every two years. So again, this tension uh, with with adversaries. We have a question well, on, on. Can I can I just sure. go back to the one about the primaries? Because I this this was uh, a student Bethany had, had posted do. that. So yeah. the interesting thing about the prime the, the the electoral system in the U.S., which is you know so rather different than most other countries, is that you have in in effect it's like you have you know you have this duopoly of parties, but it's almost as if you have different parties within each party. Um, unusually now we actually have a you know, a faction within a party that calls itself With the a Tea Party, party yeah. within the Republican yeah. Party. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and so the primaries are where each of those duopolies gets to sort of have their contest. Um, and so, so normally we would think that a political party would be this, like a, like a business enterprise. It would be this firm where inside it, they're cooperating for the sake of the success of the, of the whole entity. But we see very clearly uh, in political parties that they have to go through this phase where they have to actually compete Against each other internally, and then some, and they have to do that in a way that doesn't completely compromise their ability afterwards to to compete externally against the other. So it's a very, it's a it's a very delicate balance, but it does help us. And I think this is what Bethany will be exploring in her in her project. But it does help us to sort of explore the the tensions, but also the links between cooperative behavior and competitive behavior. So we'll give a shout out to Bethany, and yeah. we hope she's watching. We received a, qu a question on Twitter. Um, and it says, if corporations were ruled as sports teams are ruled, would that not be a big burden for them? Um, that, that's a complicated question because one of the one of the things we realize when we when we like to use the analogy, and I like to use the analogy of sports and and sports teams, is that sports teams are also also businesses. So it's um, so it's it's it, you know it's hard to it's hard to know sometimes when to separate you know sports as a business from sports as sports. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, maybe you can help me what you think sort of the question is getting at in well, terms of. Well, maybe I could elaborate it with something that you've, yeah. you've written yourself where you, you, you compare business to sports and you talk about your own background playing hockey and other sports and being a big sports fan. We'll come, come back to that in just a second. But you write, what we call business ethics is a lot like good sportsmanship. We can be ferocious competitors, but also gracious sportsmen who don't cheat or disrespect their opponents. Um, and then, you know, on this theme again mm -hmm. of, of sports as a metaphor for whether the business community or for life, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the question. Well, actually, we can invite to. we can invite that person to, to to retweet a question. I guess it, it, it is hard when you only have 140 characters sometimes. I think to get the please do if you're if you're watching, uh, <laughs> send it back in, and we'll try and, and ask ask the question again. But um, so we well, do, the, so we do recognize that. I think in I, I, you know the the, the the sports world is sort of like. You know, in a way, especially I think if we think of, um, you know, sports as we play in them or, you know, sort of at that smaller scale uh, or at least at an idealized level where we imagine that the team's sort of competing for the for the entertainment of the spectators, um, it, it obviously gets complicated and messy when you start, you know, kind of delving into the, the politics and the business behind it. But uh, so the sports world is interesting because we do we do recognize very early on these these limits to to a, you know, ferocious competitive behavior, um, and we respect them and we reward them, so that um, you know while we're while we're learning some ethical 
lessons, so to speak, on our mother's knee. We're learning about how to be nice and cooperate with the other kids and things like that. We learn other lessons when we're when we're learning about sports. So we mm -hmm. learn how to how to how to play hard, but not to not to sort of develop, you know, bad thoughts about your opponent, or not to or how to when the whistle blows, all of a sudden you 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 learn that impulse control that that whistle is blown, the play is over, and now you're not actually, you know. You're not actually competitors anymore. You're just sort of people again, and um, and that you don't have to, and that you and that you respect people, and that there's a whole point to why you're you're doing this game together, and that you try not to lose sight of what the what the point of sort of good, fair, fun sporting competition is. And right. so we want to, in a way, we want to be able to translate some of those lessons into these other realms where where we recognize you're a ferocious competitor, as say, as a lawyer, but that you can get together with the opposing attorney for a drink afterwards and you respect each other as professionals. That kind of thing. So let's talk sports for, for a few mm -hmm. minutes. Uh, you, your other blog, as a reminder, is This Sporting Life, uh, and it's filled with just wonderful posts and commentary about the intersection of sports with many of the things that mm -hmm. we've been talking about. Um, you and I are talking today. It's, it's April 2011. We're about to go into the final weekend of the March Madness. It's the final, final four for both the men and the women. You have called this tournament the American Idol of Sports or the Perfect Sporting Storm. Maybe we can put up on our screen uh, a graphic showing, showing what you have to say about this. Um, and so what is it about the NCAA tournament that you find so appealing? Yeah, th so this, this post comes from uh, last year I was on sabbatical and, uh, and when I started up this blog and, and I've sort of have worked now through the entire sporting calendar. And, uh, and I did have rather, you know, rather fewer constraints on my time, which meant I could spend a little bit more time in the afternoon during uh, all of March Madness, sort of seeing some of those games and listening to all the chatter that goes on, because I think there's probably more airtime filled with people talking about March Madness than there is with actual basketball games. Um, so, I, so I really sort of got in, got it, was able to get into the spirit of it in a way that I'm, I usually am not because of other sort of teaching obligations and things. Um, so one of the... Yeah, I think I, call, I called it there the, the, the American Idol of, of sports. And, and actually, I, got, I noticed I got kind of dissed on, on some other blogs at the time for you know, being another, another person that doesn't really understand uh, college basketball. But, I thought I you mean, were going to say you don't understand American Idol. Which, yeah, we could. Which so, perhaps we you know, for some people. I mean, to take one step back, you know, so one could call American Idol you know, the, 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 the March Madness of karaoke singing. Um, so one of the interesting things is why is it that we like American Idol? Why are, well, we, I mean, at any rate, why, why do so many people like American Idol? Because, uh, I mean, I don't know if you know the viewing figures, but it, whatever it is, you know, it's one of the, it's often the top rated show of the week. So you right. literally have tens of millions of people tuning in to watch that. You could have, you know, name your best singers, name your best six singers in America right now from, you know, Aretha Franklin to um, Bob Dylan. Um, and you could put them on for an hour on prime time and, you know, you'd get PBS like viewing figures. So it's, it's, it, so the right. crazy thing is why is it that when we put these karaoke singers singing covers in a, in a competitive format, all of a sudden that becomes so much more and interesting And you said it, in part it's because we can identify with them. Yeah. As we and, can, as we can with the NCAA tournament. And, and we identify with people in sort of competitive situations. So this, this sort of brings us back. So, so we... You know, we, we're not just listening to the singing and the performance, but we're watching this person, you know, trying to punch above their weight. Uh, and we're kind of rooting, f we, you know, we take a rooting interest in some of them and that. And somehow this makes it so much more appealing than watching, you know, Aretha Franklin and the other five greatest singers of our time uh, singing on TV. So, and I think, so, so what, what is it about March Madness? So, you know, March Madness is, is similar in a sense that... Um, that uh, you know we're 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 looking at a lot of basketball players you know I don't know what 99 percent of whom will never play in the NBA right so they aren't you know they're 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 not at that level they're not at the Aretha Franklin level of of basketball um, now in every other country that has development leagues they they would call this the second or third division or they would call right. it the D League and none of that stuff would even be on TV so it is interesting that we found a way. We've, we've found this formula for making development leagues, in many cases, more interesting to us than the big leagues. And I think that's partly the same reason lots of people are more interested in American Idol than in watching Aretha Franklin, that, that you, you, know, you sort of identify with the struggle, you see yourself in their faces, 
you see, you know, your better self trying to do, you know, better than it can. You see the emotion of. The, so I want to ask you about yeah. some of the things you've written about on your yeah. your blog, and maybe we can just get some some quick quick questions and answers because I I found some of them really interesting. So one was about: is it better to watch uh, the basketball and other things on on television or or live? Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. In fact, I'm I'm working through that now, and I I, I keep promising to do. You're, you're not flying to, down to Houston this I keep, weekend. No, I keep I keep promising to do a post on 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 what different sports are like live because I have I have written a lot on the way we broadcast different sports and I think that some sports um, I think the NFL in particular both in game and some of the some of the shows between games um, is amazingly well done and and by by well done I mean in particular it with the slow motion and the replays and the commentary yeah, but also in in you know it, it it explains to us really what's actually going on in the minds of the competitors as they're trying to work out their strategies right. and execute them um, so that it doesn't look, in other words, we, we take away from sort of the randomness and the, and just sort of the excitement of seeing what happens. And we, we, we're able to better understand what it is that they're trying to do, why they're trying to do it. And in particular in this strategic situation where they know somebody's trying to stop them and they're trying to kind of outsmart them. Right. Uh, now, lots of sports, the way they're broadcast, I find, um, and I think hockey and soccer are the worst ones, that the broadcasters do almost nothing to sort of explain what's what's sort of, you know, what what the tactics, what the strategies, what's going right. on, and we just see a kind of random excitement. I think basketball varies. Uh, there are some very good broadcasts, and others. It's so easy to watch basketball if you're if you're kind of rooting for one of the teams and get excited just because right. there's so much. So different there. different sports, different viewing experiences. But yeah. let me let me go down some of the others yeah. on the list. Uh, another thing you you wrote about I thought was quite quite interesting was about how and this is probably something we'll see uh, at the end of the tournament um, is players thanking God after they've won or before the game, you know, calling on God for their team to win. And you you had some thoughts on that. Um. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's um, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting and understandable phenomenon, um, and I think it's very genuine. Um, I think you know people, you know, there, are, there are athletes who who believe very strongly in God, who who have kind of used that belief for inspiration in lots of ways. But how about the, but it's very, the but it's very, of that? But it's very, you know, it, it is. It it always seems somewhat odd in, you know, when, when you're talking in a competitive situation, especially in these ones where we call it. Uh, zero sum competitions where basically you have somebody wins that means somebody else has to lose some right. some kinds of competitions you know you can all end up sort of being better off but in this case somebody wins somebody loses um, and so it, it you know it is it is sort of odd to think that your your god is kind of intervening on your behalf especially when your you know your opponent has other people who are who believe in the same god and who are praying to him right. or her um, so it's so so that I, I always do find that a bit peculiar and I think it partly it's sort of not in a way, not recognizing how different you know competition is from other kinds of things we do in life, where where other things we do in life, you know, everybody can kind of win sometimes. Yeah. Um, especially if you if you kind of live a virtuous life where what you're doing is cooperatively helping others to sort of succeed. Right. But in sports, it's a it's a little bit different. You know, well, if you win, somebody has to lose. That might be a good time, uh, Wayne, to go back mm -hmm. to the question. We have gotten a follow up on okay. Twitter, and good. I just want to remind everyone watching that we invite your questions as well. Um, so, as you recall, we were talking about the, the uh, juxtaposition of business and of sports as a model for that. And so here's the follow-up question, which is, I find norms of sportsmanship, for instance, very constraining. Are they too constraining for business? So, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's... And, and the follow-up oh, okay. to the follow-up. Oh, okay. Uh, or <laughs> corporations want more than to win a game. They want to survive in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are both great. So the the um, you know the the so so one of the things that we do with with uh, with markets and with sports is that we have a lot of rules and regulations, and we have a lot of referees, um, and in both but in both cases, probably even more so in markets than in sports, the referees can't see everything. Um, and one of the complications that we see in the world of big business is that there's a lot of interaction between the referees and the players. Um, I think if we were talking about sort of the GE, the GE tax, uh, tax non, I was going to say tax evasion, but that wouldn't that wouldn't be fair. But the 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 issue right now of GE not paying corporate taxes legally because they found you know loopholes or you know tax incentives and that sort of thing. Uh, but but part of that GE story is also about the way GE is just heavily 
uh, you know, imp implicated with the regulators that are regulating them, with the people, with the offices that are writing the tax law, with with uh, the White House and political offices. The CEO of GE is on a is chairing a committee uh, that Obama has set up for for kind of competitiveness in, right. in modern business. So so we see so unlike in sports where you know in, in in many cases the referees at least in North American sports are are pretty independent and they can, there's a they, lot can more they can the, throw a flag and that's yeah. that's that. Yeah, and there's a, the, 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 you know there's a lot more ability to kind of sort of interact with the referees and with the rule makers right. about, for particular players in business. So that's what, that's kind of one of the differences there. I'm not sure if that that, that doesn't quite address the the question of the of the um, of the of the tweeter. I mean, one of the it, it's true that one of the you know one of the differences about sports is that especially I think you know well paid professional sports is that you can lose the game or the championship and you walk away and you you come back another day or what have you. But uh, you know we, it is worth remembering that uh, while business is like a game, um, it's a you know it's a it's a very serious matter and with right. very serious repercussions for all of the people involved in this you know this idea of sort of in some you know, sectors in particular where it's a kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world where you actually, you know, losing that game means, you know, perhaps losing everything you ever had if you were an entrepreneur or right. losing your job or what have you. Right. So let's take an email question. We've uh, received an email from John, who's here in Durham, North Carolina. And John writes, I am involved in a local youth sports program, and we have been struggling with a question involving the behavior of the spectators, in our case, mostly parents. We strive to teach good sportsmanship, but there seems to be mixed messages when it comes to how we as parents want our youth to act on the court or field and how parents act as fans. We don't want parents booing, heckling the opposing team's players, or arguing with the referees. How do we as parents instill in our children what is good sportsmanship when we continually give them examples of behavior that is contrary to that message? Well, I, I, actually, I would I would love to have a conversation with this person because this person probably knows a lot more about it than John. Than John, I do. if you're watching, uh, it's Wayne <laughs> the, Norman, um, Duke University. But I think I think those are just the, just excellent comments because you know in a way so so one of the things that the educative value of sports, among other things, I mean it's it's good you know it's obviously good to have kids involved in physical activities, but when they're involved in sports, they it is a it is a training ground for learning a lot of these ethical lessons about sort of drawing the boundary between, you know, cooperation and competition and between, you know, competing, well, as, as the blog says, as, you know, playing, playing to win but playing fair and, and being able to respect your opponent right. despite trying to, in effect, defeat them. And so it is, it is terribly disconcerting that when parents have, have lost what that context is and, you know, and, and I mean, you know, it's just a fact that you can see in opinion polling that just a, a vast, a huge percentage of, of American parents are deluded about their children's um, uh, probability of being able to get into high-paid professional sporting leagues. Right. Like a mass, like, like 40% think that if their kid just worked a bit harder. But what you're um, saying is, as a philosopher and, and an ethicist and someone who thinks about these things is that if mom or dad is out over there on the sidelines freaking out and yelling and mm -hmm. screaming and being, being abusive either to their yeah. team or to the other team, that actually there's some really serious business going on there in terms, yeah. in terms of the moral education. I mean, education. They're, they're in effect modeling a, a kind of behavior that their, that their child will carry into their, their world, their life in, in business or their life in politics or mm -hmm. their life as a lawyer. I mean, that's, that, that's the time where we want them to sort of learn how to have these very strong competitive urges, but to be able to sort of, you know, stop them at the whistle or stop them when you realize that if you erase that, figure on the accounting table and write in another one that you're crossing a line. Right. Um, so we, you know, we, we, we want them to, you know, we're trying to sort of, you know, you know, part of it is actually just sort of teaching impulse control, but also just lots of general things about, about respect in these situations. So I think parents should realize that the chance of their kid ever making a lot of money in professional sports is, is next to zero. Uh, but the chance of them being in other competitive situations where, you know, they will get themselves into trouble or they will do damage if they don't learn some of those lessons of sportsmanship is All quite high. All right, ready for one more sports sure. question? So let's talk about what you were just writing about on the blog most recently, which is the Wonderlick test. And this whole, which is, for those who are unfamiliar, a, a test that the National Football League uses with um, young players who may be drafted, which is coming up in the, in the NFL draft soon. 
uh, basically to find out how smart they are and, and how well they'll be able, how, how mm. well they're going to do up here when they're out on the football field, most notably quarterbacks, but it's used for other players as well. You have some doubts about how effective that is and about the whole notion of yeah. that. So I should, I, I have, I have colleagues who know, who would know a lot, who would, who would be able to give you a much more informed answer about, uh, about intelligence and how the brain works than, than I. Um, so what, in a, you know, in a nutshell, here's the, the issue so that everybody recognizes that of, of all the positions in sport, you know, quarterback is the one where we're really expecting sort of the quickest and in some sense deepest thinking. Um, that there's an amazing amount that has to go on in that person's head in the space of about three seconds. And that has to coordinate with unbelievable physical abilities to, you know, to deliver a ball, you know, 40 yards away that would fit through a basketball hoop almost. Um, and to do that, understanding, you know, the directions of 22 different people who are moving around them. So we recognize that an awful lot of processing has to go on very quickly in the head. So, so what have, what have uh, teams uh, done to sort of figure out whether prospective quarterbacks are, they, they give them an, an IQ test. And uh, so I'm not, uh, not from, so I'm not an expert in anything uh, that I'm going to say from now on. So, so one of the things that they find is that that I, that those IQ scores that come from this Wonderlick test aren't, a, a, you know, a perfect predictor of how good a quarterback's going to be. So, two of the most successful quarterbacks of all time, Brett, Brett Favre and Dan Marino, had very low scores in that. And um, and one might even think that sometimes just sort of hearing interviews with them that they're not. That they don't seem and super yet, smart in that way. On the way. field, they were brilliant. And yet, they were they were brilliant in ways that you know clearly involved a tremendous amount of cognitive processing. And I think one of the things that we learned, and this is what I don't really know about, but I'll I'll pretend. So one of the things that we've learned now, as we start to put, uh, you know, sort of study what goes on in the brain, how it works, use these fMRI scans, and you, I, I can give a shout out to an open office, uh, an office hours segment from my colleague Walter Sinnott Armstrong. That was, I think, within the last year, but it's on the it's on the site. Uh, who who explains this in much more detail? But one of the things we find out is that lots of other parts of the brain that don't do that rational calculating that the IQ test measures are incredibly involved in in intelligent decision making. And so, you know, Brett Favre's brain, parts of Brett Favre's brain are humming and processing a lot faster than your brain or my brain can do. Right. And that's why he was so successful, even if you know, that rational calculating part might not right. have been so successful. In the so I, I was going to move on, but we've received a really interesting <laughs> email question from Jeff. And so we've been talking a lot about, about sports. Not and about Jeffrey the, Immelt, by the way, the, G, the CEO of GE, I hope. Uh, no, I don't okay. think it was that, Jeff. But it is, it is an interesting question nonetheless. And it's, it's, it's talking now not about sports as a metaphor for business or other areas, but about the pressures within sports itself, notably within, within higher education. And the question is this, in what ways does the unusual merger of education with big money entertainment put additional ethical challenges upon big time college sports that doesn't appear in either other athletic realms or corporate realms? Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, uh, that's such a great question. I, I'm not sure whether you, you should actually have somebody on here sometime that talks about uh, college sports because the, you know, the NCAA is a, just a unique institution in the world in the way it's well, tried we, to... We have. You have, okay. Duke's Charlie Klotfelter, is, of course, has just come out with a, a book on exactly yes, that subject. Yeah. And, uh, um, so, so, there, so there, anyway, there are a lot of people that know a lot more about the, you know, the NCAA, but it is, it is a fascinatingly unique institution. And so one of the things that, that we, that the NCAA, you know, one of the sort of circles that tries to square is between, you know, something like amateurism and something like professionalism. And, and uh, you know, an insight of a, a colleague of ours in the law school, Kim Kravick, she sort of made me see, see this better, that there, there, there are a lot of things that we might call uh, taboo markets in the world. Um, markets for organ donation and tissue donation, um, for surrogate motherhood. And in a way, amateur athletics, both whether it's kind of at the Olympic level or at the NCAA, is a little bit like that, that we have things that look an awful lot like ma market interactions, but we don't call them market interactions. We use another name, so with... With surrogate motherhood, we talk about giving the gift of life. You don't talk about selling your baby. And with and so the NCAA require you know sort of survives in part because we're able to sort of imagine that there is a lot of amateurism going on. That it's not these aren't professional. That they athletes. are first and foremost student athletes. Yeah, and that and that's why and going back to the sort of American idol of sports, that's 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 a huge amount of why it is that we in America watch 
college, we watch development league sports as big time sports on TV and in the stadium in a way that, you know, nobody does in other parts of the world when they're looking at sort of, you know, third division soccer. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, but, but there's, you know, all, all of the, in all of these sort of taboo markets where we have kind of market-like interactions going on, but we don't call them that, you know, there are, there are sort of, you know, there's some illusion, there's some fudging, there's some contradictions. Um, it, it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't mean that it's not good to do that. I mean, it may be that by having, by not by not having an open cash market for organs, we can actually get more organ donations than if we did. Uh, similarly, we were able to provide these sporting experiences for a, a vast range of student athletes, not just the ones in sort of men's football mm -hmm. and basketball, uh, that we wouldn't might not be able to do if we didn't have sort of these, this kind of somewhat, somewhat magical way of speaking about it. Right. But it does, it does raise a lot, of, a lot of complications that I think lots of us are familiar with. Wayne, I want to close with a couple of questions about your, your life here at Duke. So as we've been talking for the last several minutes, you have extraordinarily wide-ranging interests. We've been talking about philosophy, about ethics, about economics and business, about sports. You also play guitar in a band uh, and other just very wide-ranging interests. Um, do you find that interdisciplinary, wide-ranging view to, to be a good fit with what you've been doing here at Duke? And maybe you could just briefly describe that. Yeah, I, I, I'll have to be careful not to look like I'm doing a PSA for, uh, for, for Duke, for, but, uh, but I will, I will. So, so uh, every university, and I've taught at, at several universities, every university I've ever been at has spoken the language of interdisciplinarity over the last 20 years. Um, it's a kind of buzzword in academia. And everybody recognizes that at, at some level, it's obviously useful. You, you, it's sort of crazy to have people in different buildings and different departments who are working on very similar things where if they put it together, they would get something more. Duke is the only place I've ever been at where they, it was, it was very much a conscious strategy to do a lot of very specific things to encourage those people from those separate buildings to to work together. Sometimes what they've done is set up things like the institute that I'm in, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, where, you know, people who are in different departments gather even, you know, physically uh, to, to work on some of the same things together. Um, and so, so I But you're also in the philosophy department. Yeah, I'm in the philosophy department. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody, everybody here is in some department or other, but many of us are involved in these kind of interdisciplinary institutes or, or various kinds of, or we, or we you know, Duke will encourage you to teach a, teach a class with a colleague from another department where you have students from both departments, um, that kind of thing. Um, so I found it just be, because my, my work has always, has never, you know, is never going to fit naturally just in one of these silos. Um, you know, you can't talk about business ethics without knowing a lot about, a lot about how the business world works. Right. Um, and you can't, and, but you also have to know about all, all of those things that philosophers have learned over 2,500 years of, of, working with the language of ethics. Um, so, so I found it you know, in incredibly stimulating to be in this environment. And another point of innovation, it seems to me as I'm looking at your work, is also your use of blogs and social networks. Um, it seems in your interactions with other academics, but also with your students and with the wider world, it, um, you, you seem to be extremely interested in, in this as, a, as an emerging communications technology and also for education. Yeah, so I think the, the um, you know, so. A academics were a little bit late, say, piling into, into, into social networks, Facebook in particular. Um, by a little bit late, I mean six, you know, six, six months later than, than their students or something, or a year later than their students. So, but, uh, and so it's, a, it's a generalized phenomenon now that you know, academics have this, have this means, as everybody else does, but they have this means of being you know, connected in a relatively casual way, but where you continually, because of those casual connections, like the equivalent of sort of just bumping into a colleague at the water cooler. You get, you get informed about things that are yeah. going on, you, you know, just, you know, just in the ways that those connections help. Um, I mean, obviously email 15 years ago had opened things up a lot more right. than before. So, so this is a sort of generalized thing that's going on with academics. In terms of teaching, so, and, and so, so blogging is one of the things where academics can do stuff where partly they connect with other academics and get quicker feedback than the normal you know, sort of three-year cycle between when you get an idea and when that idea appears in a scholarly journal um, and that maybe nobody will read because it's sort of too long and too obscure. So now, you, you know, you, can, you could blog that idea quickly, get some feedback, and that would help as you develop that later kind right. of scholarly product. But with teaching, I've, um, 
I've, I've been using, uh, I've been experimenting in different ways and a number of people have at Duke, uh, different ways of using blogs in classrooms. And I had mentioned that this, this small class I'm teaching this term on adversarial ethics, we're using this blog collectively and the students are all posting on it. Um, and one of the, uh, so one of the things that I, I like about doing that is that it's, it's a real kind of writing for students. So one of the things that concerns me, and my students are, are watching, though, this will sound old hat, but one of the things that concerns me is that from the first grade all the way through to the PhD, we basically ask students to write fake, fake, you know, documents. They're not really, in some sense, written for anybody. They're, you know, they're written for a professor, and you kind of know already that the professor knows more about this stuff. So than you're putting you do. a plate glass window on that process. And, and but also you're, you're you know, you're all writing that. It, so I, I think that somebody can go all the way through that process and, and forget that the whole point about writing is that you're you're envisaging a, a certain audience or a certain kind of person that currently has a set of beliefs, and you're trying to inform them about something else that they don't know or trying to get them to change their mm -hmm. views about something. And that, so everything is about how you communicate to them. It's not about reporting what's in your mind. It's about thinking what's in their mind and thinking about how you might want to sort of help them change them. And so, so, so doing, a, doing a blog post for a student on say these adversarial ethics topics is different from if I ask them to, to send me, which I have often done in the past, send them, ask them to send me a memo by email the morning of the class right. about what they thought of the readings. Right. And then they'll say, okay, here's, they'll report, here's what I thought. Right. This is what I found interesting. Right. Well, but now they have to say, what, what, you know, what might you find interesting or what might you not have thought about before that I'm gonna kind of inform you about? Right, well, as we yeah. saw earlier with, on the screen, some of what they're writing is spot on and really interesting. Uh, as a reminder, Wayne Norman's blogs are ethics for adversaries. Dot com. Dot com. And this sporting life. Dot net. Dot yeah. net. Wayne Norman is the Mike and Ruth Makowski Professor of Ethics at, in the Keenan Institute for Ethics and the Department of Philosophy here at Duke University. Wayne, thank you so much for participating in office hours today. Thanks to all of you for watching. A recording of this conversation will be available along with thousands of other videos on Duke On Demand at ondemand.duke.edu. By Duke University, online at duke.edu.